Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Drone Life News. We've got a lot to talk about this week as there is a lot of news hitting the press. And joining me as always, the editor-in-chief of DroneLife.com, Miss Miriam McNabb. Miriam, Hello. how are you doing? Happy to be here. Happy to have you here as well, which brings us to our first piece of news. It seems like as the race for drone manufacturers heats up across, well, the oceans, there's a new American, well, manufacturer who's been manufacturing other goods and services for, well, a very long time here in the States. And it looks like they might just be getting into drones as well. Miriam, what do you have? You are talking about GE. We bring good things to life. Um, <laughs> but um, GE announced, act, actually, Microdrones announced that they would be manufacturing um, GE's line of industrial drones. And this, I think, is a really great story to pay attention to because it's sort of indicative of an industry trend that we've been seeing now for a couple of years, sort of building momentum. And that is that we're um, seeing sort of big names get into the drone industry. And we're seeing it in all aspects of the drone industry and in urban air mobility, where we've got car companies taking a big position in that vertical. And with inspection drones now, with the addition of the GE industrial drones, what these are is, is uh, hardware that was developed for the use of GE in inspection and uh, they decided they didn't want to go into drone manufacturing. So they partnered with Microdrones, a European drone manufacturer, and uh, they've licensed their entire line of industrial drones for production. I think it's really interesting. We'll see if they can take a market position. We'll see... Um, kind of how the how the function works out. I think they definitely have a name advantage. You know, everybody knows GE. It is a name advantage. We'll see what happens. You know, manufacturing drones is not the same as manufacturing uh, everything else. They got to fly. <laughs> but GE certainly has um, a long and honored history of industrial design. So we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, don't they have a long history in creating uh, turbine engines as well in the aviation business? Is that right? Not sure. I believe so. I think so. I think so. I'm not sure if it was like bought or acquired by another company, but I know that GE, like you said, does have an extensive history in even aviation-based manufacturing. So I know what we can expect from them is probably going to be huge, but also probably reliable, as I know that uh, GE is the only one who can keep my thermostat running at the right temperature. So, <laughs> um, but that brings us... All in the details. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, but that brings us into our next story story as it seems like Verizon, and if you remember, Verizon purchased the company Skyward many years ago, and it seems like they are now taking Skyward and taking drones, well, into the future. Miriam, what's going on here with Verizon? Yeah, this is uh, another just sort of fascinating to story to follow because if you think about what Verizon does, Verizon is a communications company and something obviously critical for expanding advanced operations uh, for drones, communications. And I think that Verizon has been extremely forward thinking. They purchased Skyward as you mentioned, you know, Skyward has been headed by Mariah Scott, um, you know, very well respected woman in the industry. She has really had the ear of Verizon's uh, CEO, and they have really done a good job of saying, hey, how does the 5G rollout that is central to Verizon's goals, you know, in the very near future, enable the drone industry. And they're diving deep into that and they're saying, how can our corporate and industrial customers be served by us figuring out how to leverage these new communications technologies in robotics, automation, and drones. And so that is what they have developed. Uh, Mariah Scott will be taking over that division. I think it's called the robotics uh, industry division. 
does include ground-based robots as well. But they're really exploring for their industrial customers how increased communications power can um, be leveraged to automate and and utilize robotics efficiently. So uh, very interesting. I think that we're going to see a lot more of that, of just sort of huge companies saying, hey, how can we leverage what it is we offer in the drone robotics automation space? Wow. Wow. Definitely. Uh, definitely that medium between the communications and drones, I know will definitely empower the UTM, the deliveries and whatnot, although it is interesting. Uh, I wonder what type of, if any, interference that we would face as other operators or other aircraft or if it would have any impact as a whole, because uh, I would say I'm not really crazy familiar with 5G technology and uh, the roles that it can play. Although I will say one time I was mapping the uh, Denver Convention Center and I sure did have enough interference to not be able to take off when I was near one of those antennas. <laughs> so, uh, so 5G was explained to me. I had the opportunity to talk to somebody from Verizon a couple months back, actually about the, the crisis response work they did, which is phenomenal. But um, they described, you know, 5G as sort of, you know, 4G was you were adding another lane to the highway, but 5G is you added another lane and you made all of the lanes a whole lot wider. So everybody just goes so much faster. And what that means for the drone industry is, um, you know, it's an it's a latency issue. So when you talk about real time streaming the data, for first responders or for, you know, flight beyond visual line of sight or or whatever. You're talking about improving the latency issues for drone operators. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, now, Miriam, I know this next kind of series of stories all intertwine as it looks like the Federal Trade Commission is now cracking down on what it means to have drones that are quote unquote made in America. And I know as I've taken, well, many drones apart as you can see kind of behind me, but a lot of these drones have Chinese parts in them. And it's, this is a question that I've been asking for a long time of, you know, what, where does the line actually get crossed as far as what's Chinese and what is not. But that also may have an impact somewhat, or I might be completely wrong, uh, in regards to how some of these other drones are actually being utilized by the government as it seems like there is a new classification of the blue SUAS, which are not really manufacturers, but rather approved drones. So between the FTC, between these this news with the blue SUAS and with Teal in itself, Miriam, it seems like there is a lot going on here. Can you clarify it for us? What is going on as Made in America is becoming quite a big deal? I'll do my best. So uh, this is, as a media observer, this has been just a fascinating storyline to follow for the last several years. And um, the three stories that you're referring to, uh, one is just that Teal Drones, one of the companies who had a product listed on the blue SUAS list has been now acquired by Red Cat Holdings. That's a Puerto Rico based company that's kind of putting together drone companies in the commercial space, in the inspection space, in the uh, consumer space. And now they've added teal drones uh, to represent sort of a government sector there. But the other two big stories, uh, one is the Financial Times of London broke a story about a Department of the Interior memo that went out and said blue SUAS are more expensive and less capable than the drones we were using before, and they have Chinese parts. So that is one story, you know, that memo kind of broke through the Financial Times article, and we'll talk about that. And simultaneously, last week, the FTC came out with a ruling that says, we're going to redefine and what made in America means so that uh, companies cannot claim to be made in America unless they actually meet strict guidelines. So that's about your marketing claims. You know, like the FDA says, you can't claim to make someone lose weight if your product is full of sugar or something like that. But uh, so the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, is cracking down on who gets to use the description 
made in America. So let's tackle the the um, DOI memo first. So the one thing about the blue SUAS list, and this isn't new, this is uh, the blue SUAS list from its inception is a list of five drone models. So it is not meant to be a list of trusted manufacturers or trusted sources. You know, I mean, the things go along. There's nothing wrong with these manufacturers. Absolutely. Just that the intention of the list is to list five drone models out of the thousands of drone models that are available that were developed in collaboration with the Department of Defense's Defense Innovation Unit. So they were developed specifically to meet the needs defined by the Defense Innovation Unit of the DOD. Those needs for security, those needs for functionality. And these five models um, made the list. They are all manufactured in the U.S. In fact, uh, Parrot has the Anafi USA, which is on the list, and they actually purchased a U.S. manufacturer in order to comply with that requirement. But since then, um, in the vacuum of sort of other guidance, when there have been sort of concerns about Chinese manufactured drone tech, the SUAS list, the blue SUAS list, has perhaps taken on importance it wasn't originally intended uh, to take on. So if you look at things like the Department of the Interior, which at one point was one of the largest um, users of commercial off-the-shelf drones in the government, they had a fleet of 800. They were using primarily DJI drones when the whole ban on Chinese drone tech conversation um, began, they were pressured into downing their entire fleet of drones. Then they later came back and said, okay, we agree that we will only use, um, you know, made in the USA platforms. GSA, General Services Administration, said you can only use blue SUAS uh, drones. These, these things are perhaps not the original intention of that list. And so this memo that came out from the DOI says, hey, these drones may meet your requirements at the DOD, but they don't necessarily meet our requirements at the DOI. And uh, so the memo was meant to say, hey, we need to make some exceptions here because These drones are more expensive and they don't offer the functionality that we need to do. We're not doing short range reconnaissance here. We're doing long range mapping and they're two different things and we may require different uh, equipment. So you can check that out, that article for it has sort of links to all the history because I had a ball when I was writing it thinking, hmm, back in 2017, 2019, as this progressed, um, You know, it it is all in that article on drone life, but essentially the DOI is saying, hey, this is a very, very short list that just isn't necessarily going to work for us. And I think that that's interesting for the rest of the world because, you know, the blue SUAS list has to some extent become kind of a go-to of here's what I can use that's safe. And if I just stick to this list, I I don't have to worry about it. And maybe that's not an appropriate list for, uh, you know, an appropriate use for that very limited list. So along with that, In the DOI memo, one of the points that they made was not only that these drones were significantly more expensive than the drones that the department was using previously, but that they still had Chinese parts, including Chinese circuit boards, some of them. And that's, again, another sort of perception. These drones met the security needs of the DOD. It it sort of became a thing that the list implied made in America, but the DOD didn't really say that. They just said these drones meet our security needs. So, um, so that's an interesting point. If those 
manufacturers on that list, those five manufacturers who do advertise as being made in the USA, do have significant portions of their product produced in China, then according to the FTC ruling, they're going to have to declare that. And so that's, uh, that'll be sort of interesting to see if there's any overlap between drone manufacturers who may be affected by the new FTC ruling and drone manufacturers who are on the SUAS list. And I have heard rumors that the SUAS list will be expanding, which I hope that it will, because there's a lot of good um, products out there that should, uh, I guess, get the same sort of seal of approval. But it brings up an important point as we discussed, what was it last week or the week before that, that the um, that the U.S. government has approved DJI government edition drones makes me wonder, well, does that mean that those drones will make it to the blue SUAS list? Will this, uh, how will this affect, uh, you know, the kind of made in America stuff? I mean, I know it's all intertwined. I'm just not sure if I'm able to quite connect the dots yet, Miriam. Yeah, me neither. And I I think that um, everybody's sort of scrambling here to define. And this is the case where, you know, there was a segment of the drone community that said, hey, you you just can't say country of origin because it won't work. You need to have defined security standards. And I think this is kind of coming back as a sort of double-edged sword. If you say it's all about country of origin, that may make it very difficult for some manufacturers to actually uh, source uh, the parts that they need. So maybe there need to be specific <laughs> parts or, or, uh, or, you know, specific standards that need to be met. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure about the blue SUAS list. Again, that is a department of defense list So maybe it just needs to not be applied across all um, government agencies uh, as broadly as it has been. I do think that there is an opportunity for departments like the DOI to apply for exemptions and possibly they will be able to apply for exemptions and use those government edition uh, DJI drones I don't know. I'm sure we'll we'll see what happens. But it is kind of a it's a very tricky situation that I think the government is trying to um, balance their security needs and their desire to support the domestic drone industry with um you know, a developing industry and there just aren't that many products out there right now that maybe meet all of their requirements or that they've had a chance to vet to the extent that they want to. Yeah, it is very interesting, but I'm actually kind of grateful that DOI came out and said, Hey, all these other drones, they don't work half as well. They don't fly half as far and they cost three times as much. So I think it's important for an agency to come out and kind of put its foot down and say, we can't let, uh, we can't let a lot of these manufacturers get away with what's going on. And if you want us to buy your equipment, then it's got to be usable. So I, think- I don't know if they if they came out and said that they refused to comment. I think they got outed by the Financial Times. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you- but okay, yeah, right. <laughs> They're out there now, like it or not. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, Miriam, thank you so much for uh, for giving us the news this week. We definitely appreciate it. I know. Uh, hopefully, we might be seeing each other here soon at a conference. Uh, I'm not really sure. I guess we'll we'll see what happens here in the future. But as always, thank you so much. Do appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate you too. Always fun to be here. Well, thanks again. And thank you everyone else. And for watching this edition of Drone Life News, if you want to leave us a comment or subscribe, please go ahead and do so. Let us know what you think. And we are having a shorter show this week just because uh, here at Drone U, we are slammed with trainings this summer. So thank you again to everyone. Thank you for the support. Thank you, Miriam. And that's going to do it for us today for another edition Drone Life News. Have a good week, everyone.